Brian White. I'm chair of the Stanford Mathematics Department. And this lecture is one of a series of public lectures organized by Stanford's Mathematics Research Center and by the Friends of Stanford Mathematics. In fact, let me, uh, so if you're not on our mailing list, on our emailing list, and would like to be notified of these lectures, just uh, send an email to this address and uh, we'll add you to our list. This evening, we're very fortunate to have as our speaker, Professor Cedric Villani. Professor Villani is one of the world's leading experts in partial differential equations and in mathematical physics. He did his undergraduate studies at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, and he received his PhD in 1998 at the Paris Dauphine University. He became a professor at the École Normale Supérieure in Lyon in 2000, and then later at the University of Lyon. Since 2009, he has also been the director of the Henri Poincaré Institute in Paris. He has won numerous awards for his mathematical work, including the Jacques Herbrand Prize of the French Academy of Sciences in 2007, the Prize of the European Mathematical Society in 2008, the Fermat Prize in 2009, the Henri Poincaré Prize also in 2009, and in 2010, the Fields Medal, the most prestigious award in mathematics. More recently, he has become a Knight of the National Order of Merit and a member of the Legion of Honor. In addition to his research, Professor Villani is also famous for his ability and enthusiasm for communicating mathematics to general audiences. He has appeared on television many times, and he features prominently in a forthcoming film about mathematics. Recently, he has written an autobiographical book, Théorème Vivante, that describes the sometime chaotic process of research that led him and a collaborator to the birth of a particular theorem. The book has already been translated into Italian, German, and Serbian, and is currently being translated into five other languages, including English. Please join me in welcoming Professor Villani, who will talk to us about the mathematics of bats. Okay, thank you very much. Everybody hear me? Microphone on? Okay, thank you. And uh, here we are, very good. So, today will be a lecture of mathematics of bats. This is not a lecture intended for mathematicians. This is neither a course in mathematics. It is just some story and some glimpse of uh, what mathematics is about and uh, the kind of problems that uh, mathematics can be involved in that one would not necessarily think of if you are not in this business. And uh, I will take the example of uh, bats for various uh, reasons. I will explain how this uh, example came to my mind and uh, how this is one of the several lectures which I prepared when it comes to addressing general audiences. It will be also the opportunity to recall a few things which are elementary but good to keep in mind about nature of mathematics and uh, how, we, uh, we, how we understand it and so on. Um, of course, we are coming here, but it's, uh, Halloween was uh, not far ago. And so when you think of uh, uh, bats in Halloween season, maybe these are the images that this uh, brings to mind. Of course, also with uh, spiders being not far in terms of frightening animals. But as we know, this is all fake in the sense that it's just one point of view that we like to have. If we replace these sinister images by these friendly images of the same creatures, then it becomes a completely different perspective about bats and spiders. Let's uh, start by one example of the many geometric forms that you can find in nature. This, of course, is a web. And uh, uh, we see here it looks like it's made of very simple objects, like straight lines, angles, and so on. And uh, is already a very simple figure that you observe in nature that would be, of course, prone to be described. 
by uh, simple mathematics like simple geometry. And simple geometry certainly was one of the first fields in mathematics that was developed. Here, this many people in the audience probably recognize or guess what this is. This is one, uh, one picture, one page from one of the most uh, famous books uh, ever written, The Elements of Euclid, uh, which is considered as the treatise which was uh, most edited in the story of mankind. I mean, there are other kinds of books, like religious books, which were more edited than the elements, but when it comes about the treatise, elements come first with more than thousands editions. And uh, for a long time, it was uh, the basis of the curriculum in mathematics. This was, in fact, some, it, even though it was not religion, it had some feeling about it. It was a book that was founding a new philosophy and a new way to see things and the idea that, in retrospect, looked a bit crazy, that it was possible to do interesting things and to learn interesting things with the following procedure, which now we call mathematics. We start with a set of axioms, postulates, that we don't bother to justify, and from them we go on only by logical reasoning, never adding anything that what wa than what was already contained in the postulates. Now you think if you work in this way, you won't get far. And uh, that's the magic of mathematics, is that you get very, very far, even though it looks, it looks stupid as a way to proceed. <laughs> and uh, the elements of Euclid reflect this better than anything else. They start that by a very short list of axioms, postulates, a few of them, and uh, from them, an incredible variety of uh, theorems, of figures, of patterns, etc., that you would never have thought were contained in the basic axioms. And uh, that's one reason why this uh, treatise was translated in all possible languages, edited, etc. It remained a kind of exemplification of this idea that starting from very little and just using logic, you can go very, very far. So this is one example of translation, you see, in Latin language. If you ask people on the street or in this room probably, one example of a theorem, like the one there is in Euclid, with very, very high probability, they will answer Pythagoras' theorem. At least in France, that's the way it is. Probably here also, not sure. Yes, I see people saying yes. Yes, Pythagoras' theorem. And if you ask for another theorem, it's, and it's, it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> but one is already good. So why the hell is Pythagoras' theorem important? Well, you can live without it. But it is still uh, interesting, Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, first, it's very simple, it's very elegant. It says the following. If you have a triangle with a square angle, 90 degrees, and I look at the length here and here, and I take the squares and I add them up, then it's the same as the square of this opposite side. Here, 9 is 3 times 3, 16, that is 4 times 4. The sum is 25, which is 5 times 5. Good. And it's not just for this triangle, it's for every, every uh, uh, triangle with a right angle, with a straight angle. Now, why is Pythagoras' theorem important? Is that you see, it gives you relations between the basic objects which are used in geometry, length and angles. And uh, it goes in both ways, by the way. If I have a triangle and I have a right angle here, I know that the sum of the squares of these op sides here near the right angle is the same as the square of this opposite side. And conversely, if the, uh, I know that the square of this is the sum of the squares of this and this, then it will be a right angle here. This uh, Pythagoras theorem, by the way, is used has been, there is a long tradition of uh, it being used by uh, carpenters, you know, to check that you have a right angle, what do you do? You take, uh, you take some string or something, you measure, for instance, you measure three, four, and you check that you have five here, and if this is the case, then you know the angle here is right. People who have no idea who Pythagoras was, who have no idea why, how this theorem is proven, but who use it in daily life. 
And uh, also, imagine you want to, it's very practical in a way, imagine you want to build, I don't know, a soccer field game or whatever, or American football or something, uh, in some place, and you want a perfect uh, rectangle. How do you do this? Well, rather than measuring angles, which will be difficult if it is a three by four meter, you take, for instance, some string in the total length of uh, 12, 12 meters, let's say, and uh, you count three meters, four meters, and you arrange things in such a way that you have exactly five meters here, and so the string, the, the, the string is, uh, closes itself, and then you know there will be a right angle here, and you can have your rectangle. So it was a very practical theorem, and it is still used as a very practical tool by many people. At the same time, it's also a very beautiful natural statement. First, you have one right angle, and then you have this relation between the length. So it's uh, uh, very harmonious. But there is a way to recast the Pythagoras theorem, which is quite equivalent, even though it is rarely done in this way, in terms of rectangles. Because rectangle is two, like two triangles with a right angle. And you could see it as an envelope, okay? And the way you would say is that if you take this rectangle, you take the sum of the squares of the diagonals, it will be the same as the sum of the squares of the sides. You take the four sides, you adapt the squares of the length. You take the two diagonals, you adapt the squares, you find the same result. We could state the Pythagoras theorem in this way, and we would think about it as a theorem not on triangles, but about rectangles. Why not? And then, someday, you discover this, and I recall how I was amazed at school when this came. Take a parallelogram, so two sides parallel, two sides parallel, look at the diagonals, and the sum of the squares of the sides is the same as the sum of the squares of the diagonals. And then you think, that's amazing. First you think, but how is it possible? Or did they lie to me? I thought this was the property of the rectangle. And I learned in school it's important to have this Pythagoras theorem to have the sum of the squares. And now I see it's not about rectangle. It's about sides being parallel, two by two, and we have the same exact theorem, which is called, by the way, the parallelogram theorem often. This here is important because on this very simple basic example, we can learn the principle of generalization, one of the important principles in science. And we see something that we thought was true if we have a rectangle. In fact, it's still true in the more general situation in which we have a parallelogram, which is tilted, but still have the same property as if their angle was straight. And this is why it's uh, important to do mathematics in the way. Not that you, we really need this theorem later in life. For most of us, we don't need it. But on simple example, we see the power of one of the important uh, ways to work in science, which is generalize and try to understand which is the minimal set of assumptions under which something is true. And we don't learn it by listening to the teacher or hearing it for somebody who knows. We can reprove it. That's the other important thing. We can prove it for ourselves, and that's the whole principle of mathematics, which, in a sense, is the most uh, the science which is most close to us, in particular when you're a student, because you can always prove everything for yourself rather than learn it by believing from something else, from somebody else. You know, we learn in physics about atoms and so on, but atoms we never saw, or some of you may be uh, with uh, electronic microscopes and so on, but most of us never saw an atom. We believe they exist because we are told so. But the parallelogram theorem, we can prove it, and then we really know it is true by certainty. When I was a teenager, I was fascinated by triangle, <coughs> triangle geometry. This book was one of my favorite, Geometry of Triangle. All kinds of uh, very inventive situations and theorems and configurations. And triangle geometry, I have to say, is an area that is really, really serves nothing. <laughs> I mean, if you're a mathematician, it's a dead area. Nobody works any longer in triangle geometry. 
And if you're a non-mathematician, you don't care because you never ever use these things in real life. <laughs> but having said that, it still teaches, it still taught me in a way what it may be the most important ability to make reasoning and proofs. It became my job to, be, to make proofs. And you know, if it is a good way to train and to learn the job, then it's perfect. Learn triangle geometry as good as anything else, as a way to train your ability to make a proof. Now, in triangle geometry, what is great is that you have miracles and you explain the miracles. Sometimes there are things like you have three lines that cross at a single point, sometimes four lines. Sometimes, on the contrary, you have four points which are aligned on the same line, even though they were constructed by various and such and such recipes. It looks like a miracle. And you learn that it's not a miracle and you can prove why this is true. It's again, in miniature, you can do the whole scientific, scientific uh, work and uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the whole chain, if you want. I observe something, there is something weird, and I will understand what is behind it and I will prove it. And that's why triangle geometry is precious. Okay, and uh, let's say that I was, uh, I found this very beautiful. And uh, uh, another thing, yes, let me share also this one to you. Sometimes you have the surprises. I told you, okay, sometimes you take the, tri the, you take the rectangle, you twist, you tilt it, and you still have the parogram, and things are still true for this. It's a generalization. Sometimes generalizations, make you big surprises. Like, see here, in Euclid, even though we don't necessarily lead Latin language, we see that it's about regular figures here. This is a square, this is a pentagon, this is a hexagon. So we have regular, regular polygons with four, five, six, and we could continue like this. Draw polygons with seven, eight, nine, etc. sides and we can compute what is the angle, etc. And now you won't say, okay, this is two-dimensional geometry, let's go three-dimensional and draw a regular polyhedra, so generalization of a polygon with uh, six or seven or eight or nine uh, sides, all equal, regular, like, like this one, with same angles. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work, and in all the possible polyhedra that you can, that you can draw, a convex polyhedra to be, conve to be precise, there are only five which are regular, not one more. This is, is one, uh, tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, hesochahedron, only five of them, and Greeks already knew this. And then they thought, this is amazing. How is it possible? You start from very simple concepts, angle, length, and ask that there is equality of everything so that you have a regular figure, and you discover there are only five of them. It looks like a magical law of nature. And you see here also this thing. In mathematics, you have the impression you discover profound, deep laws of nature because you find things that you, you didn't put and still they are there. So it's like laws of, of the world in a sense. And this is only one thing. People, when they found this polyhedra, they uh, tried to, to use them. For instance, at some point, people were convinced there was a relation between the fact that there were five regular polyhedra and five planets in the solar system. And they tried to explain the distances from the sun to the planet by using these polyhedra. Of course, one day, some guy discovered a sixth planet and it all collapsed. <laughs> but still, there was this uh, idea that you can explain much more looking at the formulas. After some uh, time, I was fascinated by this and that, and I entered École Normale Supérieure in mathematics. Somebody uh, asked me uh, a few hours ago, as many people, when you were young, did you take mathematics in class, etc., or mathematics specialty or extra mathematics? I said, no, you know. In French system, if you're good in mathematics, you just end up doing mathematics without asking really the question. And uh, indeed, 20 years old, I was in École Normale Supérieure, and not uh, without having ever thought about what I would do for a living. I was not aware that uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure was a very good place for doing mathematics. In fact, it's a place in the world which has among its former students the highest number of uh, Fields medalists uh, by far. 
And, uh, but uh, still I, would, I could enjoy, it was interesting place in which maybe I would discover what mathematics is really, so to speak. One thing that you discover when you enter higher school like Ecole Normale Supérieure is that you have, will have to choose among the various branches of mathematics. This is not necessarily expected. You know people in your family who know you are doing mathematics, they already think that you're a bit special. And <laughs> if then you start telling them, you know, now you have to choose which sub-part of mathematics or sub-sub-part are we going to study, they start to be really frightened for you, you know? <laughs> But you learn that you have to specialize and that you have to go and uh, choose between algebra, geometry, analysis, etc. It is a bit frightening. You, you can think this is very narrow and you are going to be uh, trapped in some uh, very narrow area. And one thing I have learned in the process, and I uh, know I'm sure it's true in many areas of life, is you should not be uh, afraid of specializing. This is the way to later dig and learn more about what's outside. It's better to do like this, first specialize and then enlarge rather than doing, trying to do everything at the same time. So anyhow, I specialize into analysis. And uh, at uh, some point, I was not aware of this, but I was, little by little, learning my job, my job of mathematician. Mathematician is a real job. There are Yes, 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 it is a real job. When you, when you tell somebody you're a mathematician, like, you know, taxi driver, oh, you're a mathematician, so you do big, big multiplications. That's, that's the usual, usual thing, they think. Sometimes on the TV, they ask, can you do for me uh, 3,972 times uh, some big number? They say, no, I cannot do this, etc. <laughs> but it's a real job. It's a good job. You know, it's a job that makes you happy, and I was happy enough to get a Fields Medal, this was in 2010, working on some equations which are written behind me here on the blackboard. And then it's, uh, uh, I was, uh, after this, I was uh, invited in many places and interviews. This is a picture which appeared in an in a intellectual magazine, cultural magazine, and the title they put was, I am the Lady Gaga of mathematics. <laughs> no offense, of course. <laughs> this is an uh, encounter with a uh, marvelous guy who is an artist and does these wonderful new instruments. Um, very helpful, both for artistic creation and for contact with uh, handicapped uh, youngsters. I became president of his association. You know the uh, idea being that it was interesting to have uh, somebody, a scientist, uh, being part of his project. That's one very interesting part of uh, what happens to you as a mathematician. Okay. And then I was also in fashion magazines at some point. <laughs> and uh, of course, all these people, they talk, so you see here, mathematician, mathematician, this is your job, etc. And uh, why I was invited and uh, giving talks and lectures and so on, and people, they always had this question in mind. What is it to be mathematician? What do you do? What is the work of a mathematician? I just said it's a very good work. I have to be, to be convincing. And this is what all people were interested in hearing. They uh, had this idea from uh, high school that mathematics is just some kind of torture. And uh, now they hear it's an interesting job in which you can be happy, make discoveries, etc. And uh, you have to tell about what it is about. Now, in 2009, Wall Street Journal had this idea to make a ranking of all the jobs. And you see, I'm not making it up. What came up first, the best job in the world was not princess or trader, it was mathematician. Okay, uh, sorry for the traders here. I didn't want to be, uh, yes, uh, no offense. It was just one example. And uh, you see that, by the way, that actuary is coming very near, is coming on, on seconds, so finance is not far. Look, statistician comes third in this list. Software engineer is fifth, uh, and so on. Many scientific jobs, by the way. At the top of, at the bottom of the list, they put the lumberjack. I hope there are no lumberjacks in the audience. Uh, if there are, just be assured that this kind of ranking is complete crap, makes no sense. 
except maybe for the first place. <laughs> now, for this, uh, for this uh, ranking, they use a lot of criteria. And of course, they have to define. They define mathematician as somebody who applies mathematical theories and formulas to teach or solve problems in a business, educational, or industrial climate. What is good in this definition is solve problems. And this is important. Mathematics was created to solve problems, just like the rest of sciences, by uh, elaborate reasoning, by logical reasoning, etc., but it was to solve problems. What is good also is that they don't forget the education. What is uh, miss? There is something important, on the other hand, missing from this definition, of course. These are people like me, or many people in the audience, researchers, not only applying or teaching or using to solve problems, but also to create mathematics. And that's the other thing it's important to insist on public lectures. Mathematics is not stable. It is not done. Uh, what we learn in school, of course, is stuff that has been done hundreds of years ago. But currently, mathematics is being created currently much more than uh, ever was. Several hundreds of thousands new theorems per year worldwide as are proven. And uh, creating mathematics is a good job also. Mathematics, just a few, in a few words, if you ask what is mathematics, we can say mathematics is an abstract representation of the world in which knowledge is logically deduced from initial postulates. This is one possible definition. And uh, that's the difference with the other sciences. In mathematics, you rely only on logic. In other sciences, for instance, you know, if you have a theory and you check your theory on a billion times on various cases and it always works, then in physics, you will say the theory is right. In mathematics, no. We are not, still not happy with the billion experiments. We want a logical proof. In principle, it is universal because it depends only on the logic. In principle, infallible too. In practice, it is incomplete. First, because there are deep theorems telling you that you cannot know everything in mathematics. And often it is inaccessible just because our brains are not good enough to find all the proofs of the big theorems that we would like to prove. In mathematics, you always have this tension or this complementarity or this duality between the idea of something beautiful and it's like an artistic creation of mathematics and something that is useful and uh, is uh, interesting in solving problems. This is something remarkable. Many people have wondered and uh, being, uh, found this uh, remarkable. Here are two quotes, which are not bad. How can it be that mathematics, being after all a product of human thought, which is independent of experience, is so admirably appropriate to the objects of reality? And the second, one reason why mathematics enjoys special esteem above all other sciences is that its laws are absolutely certain and indisputable, while those of other sciences are to some extent debatable and in constant danger of being overthrown by newly discovered facts. Interestingly enough, it's not a mathematician speaking. Who knows who? Somebody knows who this is? Einstein. Albert Einstein. Uh, is the author here. So it's interesting to see. This is after his conversion. When he was young, he thought mathematics was just like, you know, not so useful kind of stuff by theoreticians. And after he understood it was so vital for uh, general relativity, he completely changed his mind about mathematics. Mathematics is also interesting is that it's full of paradoxes, special status. On the one hand, it's totally rigorous. On the other hand, it's extremely imaginative. You need a lot of imagination to find, uh, to find new objects that will solve problems. Like, for instance, in 2002, Perelman astonished the world by, with his proof of the Poincaré conjecture. And it's not that he was stronger or more powerful in computation than the others. Just the imagination was so strong that he could uh, make up objects that were so powerful in solving the problem. At the same time, it's rigorous, and mathematicians will always bother other scientists by saying, we want a rigorous proof of this and that and so on. Here I put the black sheep. This is because uh, this is a reference to the well-known uh, comic story about the, the black sheep. You know this one? No. Some, some no, some, so, some yes. So those who know just forget you know. And uh, 
there are, this is the story where there are these three people on a train, three scientists visiting a region of the world they never were, I don't know, they were in Scotland or whatever, northern than what they used to, and that some, there is a biologist, a physicist, a mathematician, they look at the window and they see this from the window, and then the biologist says, oh, sheep here, it's black, it's not the white that we are used to. And then the physicists say, okay, you don't know, we saw one sheep, maybe it's just one sheep who is black, just by accident, and the other are white. And then the mathematician looks at both colleagues, slightly despiteful, you know, and says, all we can say is in Scotland, there is at least one sheep with at least one side, which is black. <laughs> So that's the joke about the black sheep. <laughs> Mathematics is also abstract, kind of by definition. But at the same time, it is universal and applies to many concrete situations. Here I put as an example the Gaussian law, this bell curve, which is an abstract object, but which comes up in every kind of possible field with where there are fluctuations be it uh, the um, height of water of some river or the fluctuation of the size of people or whatever or the errors in the pole, you find this uh, Gauss curve coming about everywhere. And though, even though it's an abstract thing, power of mathematics is because it's abstract, it can apply to many different situations, many different concrete situations. Here I put a picture this is the picture of Lady, um, uh, the Lady of Charlotte. It's a famous poem, many of you know, of course, by uh, Tennyson. In speaking about this uh, lady, there is a curse on her, and she's not allowed to look at reality directly, but only through the mirror. Until someday comes Lancelot, who is so handsome that she watches through the window directly, and then it's a very sad story. She dies, her body goes on the river, and so on. And uh, many interpretations of the poem and so on, but you can think of it as allegory of mathematician. Maybe Tennyson did not think that way, but who knows? He did not uh, explain. So allegory of mathematician watching at the world, but only through the abstract reflection of the formulas. And uh, that's different from other scientists who can make experiments directly with the world. Uh, it's very egalitarian in the sense that when you look at the stories with the great mathematicians from the past, you feel like, this is amazing, how could they do this? It's just terrifying. On the same time, it's very democratic because any of you can uh, think about a mathematics problem, work on sheet of paper, whatever. You don't need any big equipment like to do particle physics or whatever. And sometimes it happens that people come up with a scoop and nobody expected uh, these and the big experts uh, were scooped out by uh, somebody else and so on. It's uh, very ancient and I started by Euclid but it's also in permanent mutation with always new stuff coming in and uh, new discoveries. It's uh, quite uh, solitary. Sometimes you work at night alone and you know this is not a joke of mathematicians, this the best friend of the mathematician. Because every time you try something, it is false and you just throw it in the dustbin. At the same time, it is extremely social and you always uh, go, there are, in all countries, there are people needing mathematics and uh, it's a subject that's very interesting for everybody. This is image of me in uh, public lectures in Dakar. People were so excited that the organizer were frightened for my uh, integrity or something would happen to me. And uh, as a mathematician, I visited more than 40 countries talk, talking about mathematics, teaching mathematics, whatever. And we always work in team and so on. And uh, mathematics is at the same time uh, very difficult and very simple. You can state problems that are very simple and at the same time extremely difficult. The uh, archetype maybe is this famous 3n plus 1 conjecture. Syracuse problem. You start from any integer. If it is even, you divide by two. If it is odd, you multiply by three and you add one. And you repeat the process. And in the end, you always end up with one. 
well, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, a sequence like this. It's so simple that you can make it, you can make uh, kids in school play. I've, I've made this game with, uh, for classes of uh, 10 years old. And then I tell them, you see what we just uh, recognize, it's 4 to 1 always. It's so difficult that no mathematician can explain why this is true. So if you look on the left column, it doesn't look so good about the nature of mathematics. But if you look at the right, it's very attractive. And so that's a, a problem with mathematics. If you think about this more than about this, of course, it's not very attractive. But if you think of this, it, uh, it's a very attractive career. Now, yes, let me go to the subject of the talk of today. Because here, there is this quotation by Galileo, great book of universes written in mathematical language. I already explained that the abstract concept of mathematics you can find in many places. This is also what is illustrated in this um, comic uh, drawing extracted from a blog. You see, you have this nice image of the rabbit eating the carrot. Wow, beautiful. And uh, later, an attempt to describe some of the equations that are behind. Just a tiny sample of the equations. If you really wanted to put all the equations, you would need that thick of paper. And that's the idea that whatever physical phenomena there is or sensible, you can always put it in mathematical formulas. Here, for instance, is this small river. You can feel of it like just its water. You can feel it's fresh and whatever. But you can also try to write up the formulas that are governing it. And this gives us another way to understand this that can be very useful. And in a way, whatever subject it is, you can always find mathematics behind. And this gives me to, now let me explain how this uh, bad subject came in. In 2011, I was asked to prepare a public lecture for a large audience of uh, many classes. I was tired of the public lectures I had already done, and I wanted to make a new one. And so I asked the organizer, give me an idea of a subject for this lecture. Maybe there is a particular theme in this year. You know, there are, each year has some themes and so on. 2011, it turned out, was the year of the forest. Forest, you can do mathematics in this. In Institut Poincaré, we had a semester last year, which was about sustainable environment and the mathematics of, uh, of that, of sustainable um, handling of uh, forests and resources in general, ecosystems. 2011 was also the anniversary of the, this was the 200th year of the birth of Evariste Galois one of the most famous mathematicians ever, also famous because not only did he revolutionize uh, mathematics at the age of 20, but also died at the age of 20 in a stupid uh, duel, you know. So very romantic and tragic destiny. And uh, it was also a year of uh, chemistry, and this was uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was um, attributed to Schertmann for the quasi-crystals. And this, of course, was a subject that was beautiful for doing mathematics, because these objects, these quasi-crystals, which are not exactly crystals but still have some regularity, had been constructed in the mathematical world long before, for instance, by Penrose. So all of these were very nice mathematical subjects that were possible. And then she said, it's also the year of the bat. And I said, OK, let's take this as a challenge. I'll take the bat as the subject of the lecture. And I put, just put mathematics of bats, and then I will think about what I will uh, say in this lecture. And uh, when you think about a bat, you don't think there is math much mathematics in this. OK, maybe you can think the, the shape of the ears. Very good. Parabolic type in some, in some sense. But apart from that, is not clear. However, there is a lot of mathematics, as there is in all the rest, as I explained. First thing about bats, of course, is that, ah, <laughs> Batman. Batman, by the way, is very interesting uh, in terms of uh, science. Why? What is the characteristic of Batman? You all know this. No, we're in America. 
Batman doesn't fly, and what else can he not do? Common people. So Batman is the, the first characteristic is that he has no superpower. Among all the very famous superheroes, he's the one with no superpower, taking all his strength, all his strength from science and technology. And of course, lot and lot of money that he converts into technology. But that's the main characteristic. You can think of him as one of the symbols in the comics world of uh, science. The other would be the Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen, representing science in a completely different way. So Batman is very interesting in this respect. Bats have been uh, the object of fantasies from many people, not just in the comics uh, world, but look also all these crazy pictures that uh, you can see in old books of uh, biology. In real life, they are not really like this, but still, you find all kinds of shapes. You have small bats, big bats. The, uh, there are more than 1,000 species of bats. You can, uh, some of them uh, feed on flowers, some of them on uh, insects, and some of them are blood, etc. And uh, look at these uh, different funny shapes. These ones are, are true ones. Cute, no? Bats are also extremely useful and important. This is a common point with spiders. Both of them are despised or people are afraid of them, but they should not be afraid. On the contrary, they are extremely important for economics. Here in this uh, paper from 2011, it is estimated that uh, only in North America, the economic weight of uh, bats is uh, nearly $4 billion per year because they help as natural pesticide the agriculture, much, much better than any pesticide you could put uh, to help your crops. And of course, the bats, they fly. And this is fascinating. By the way, first attempts of devising a plane or something that can fly were by imitating the shape of a bat rather than the shape of a bird. Then our planes of today are more in the shape of a bird, but uh, in the, the first attempts were more bat-like. How can we understand the flight of a bat? If we want to study it or reproduce it, what are the tools that we can have? Of course, one of these tools would be the equations for the flight. And before we understand the flight, we have to understand the motion of the air near the wings. This is related to one important concept of derivatives or differentials. Derivative is like the slope or the tendency of a signal. If you have a signal which varies like this, and uh, from this point I look at the tangent, the tendency of the slope of the curve, for instance, will be to increase, and this, the, the slope of this will be the derivative or the differential. Uh, if you look at the derivative of the derivative curve, this will be called the acceleration or the variation of variation, is a second derivative. These are ways to study how a signal, uh, what is the tendency of a signal to evolve. And uh, the illustration, graphic illustration, would be this, of course. If I look at this curve from this point, this tangent, uh, this is the tangent, and the slope is how much I go down if I move forward by one unit, say. Higher order derivatives are difficult to conceive, you know, first order still okay. If you have your bank account, you know whether you're losing money is positive derivative or, sorry, gaining money is positive derivative, losing money is negative derivative. Second order, it's okay still. Third order, you don't usually manage. There is famous quote by Nixon, which is supposed to be the first time a president alluded in public to the third derivative. <laughs> it was about the rate of increase of inflation, which is decreasing. You know, it tells you some, precisely you have the impression that he doesn't want people to really understand what is going on. <laughs> I think if, if somebody tries to sell a company to you saying the rate of increase of uh, uh, inflation of the, of, the, of the loss is decreasing, don't, don't buy. <laughs> but in the world of mathematics, higher derivatives or derivatives, they can play an important role and they are all parts of this field. Uh, which was my first specialty, partial differential equations, a huge field 
when uh, it was said that I was species of partial differential equations, one has to uh, realize when you see of somebody who's species of partial differential equations, it's only species of a few partial differential equations among the vast amount of them. They occur in all sciences, these partial differential equations, whenever you have functions of several variables. For instance, imagine I'm interested in the temperature because I want a meteorological prediction of whether it will be so hot or so cold in this or that country. Temperature depends on time, depends on the longitude, latitude, altitude, so four parameters. I can look at the increase with respect to time, if it's going to be warmer during the day or colder, increase with respect to longitude, increase with respect to latitude, increase with respect to latitude, maybe when I go up, usually temperature will decrease, and so on. And for each parameter, I can consider the tendency with respect to this parameter this should be the partial derivative. And uh, there is this big idea that relations between these partial derivatives can be used in equations that allow to predict the evolution of these functions of several variables. And they occur in all sciences, in particular with special combinations like Laplacian, which is the sum of all the second order derivatives, or the gradient, which is a vector made of all the various first order derivatives. And uh, here are some of the equations that are made up with these. So take this, this is, let's say this is a sample of the most beautiful partial differential equations you can think of. And uh, don't be afraid, just take this as a kind of artistic creation. So nice symbols. And uh, you see here, this Nablas stands for derivative, is derivative with respect to some parameter which is x. This one is second derivative, etc. All these equations have derivative in them and they are called partial differential equations. And they are all used to predict phenomena or to study some phenomena. This one, on which I worked for 10 years, is the Boltzmann equation. It, it predicts the evolution of a gas which is enclosed in a box, for instance. It is used sometimes to study the gas, uh, the, the gas that can be in a motor engine. This one below is the Vlasov equation. It is used to study the evolution of the densities of stars in a galaxy, for instance or the evolution of electrons in a plasma. These ones are some reaction diffusion equations. Turing uh, used them to start building a theory of patterns and why, how the stripes, for instance, form on the skin of the zebra or the spots on the skin of the leopard. These equations here and here are among the most important cons uh, in our daily life. Every day they are used to predict the weather and they are solved on big computers and so on to predict whether it will be that hot or that hot on in these days and so on. All of them are important and some of them we use them without noticing every day. These are the equations of general relativity in a, in a concise form. Every day we use them each time we use a GPS. They are part of our life, these equations in a way. And in particular, they have been used to describe fluids. This was one of the great adventures of mankind. Description of fluids. This is like something like crazy. We, you see, we saw in elements of Euclid, we had triangles, we had squares, etc. But what about describing water in a bottle or in a river? It looks crazy to try to describe this in mathematical terms. And this arrived quite late in uh, history. The first people to do it very seriously were Bernoulli and Leonard Euler in Switzerland. And uh, this idea was that we are going to write partial differential equations in which the unknown is the velocity of the fluid. At each point, for a certain time, a certain position, there will be a certain direction that the fluid wants to go to and we'll call this the velocity of the fluid. And we write the equation. This was one of the very first, not the absolute first, but one of the very first partial differential equations in the middle of the 18th century, the Euler equation, incompressible Euler equation. I wrote it without, okay, to be rigorous, one should have to add uh, another condition which is known as the incompressibility condition, but forget about this. Just see that here it's a partial derivative 
involving the evolution in time of the velocity field, which is the tendencies of particles to go in some direction. This equation was a huge progress. It was the first time that people started to really think of the equation of a fluid. However, it was still not fully satisfactory. As d'Alembert in France understood, there is a problem. It seems to me that theory developed with all possible rigor gives, at least in several cases, zero resistance, a singular paradox that I leave it to future geometers to solve. What does it mean? With this equation, basically, you don't feel any force exerted by the water, at least in the absence of um, of vortices of rotation in the fluid. And this is a big problem because if you don't feel the force from the air, air you will not be able to use it to fly on it. This is a big problem. And there was this story that maybe is true, maybe not, that at some point it was put to competition by the Academy for Scientists. Explain how birds can fly even though they are more heavy than air. And it was said that the only rigorous proof was that of Euler, who proved with absolute certainty that birds cannot fly. <laughs> so this was a problem. You can say then, after all, maybe it cannot, cannot lend itself to mathematics. Or you can say maybe it's just the mathematics is not well developed enough. And that was the case. In the 18th century, 19th century, sorry, Navier and Stokes, uh, obtain the equations that we now use to describe fluids and which involve an important additional feature, namely the internal friction, which is uh, inside water, if you want. The uh, viscosity, as we say, the idea that when you go into water, if, the, if you are going in this direction and there is a water particle going this direction with a different velocity, you will feel by friction that this guy is not going at the same velocity. It's like if you are in a very busy subway and you, you try to make your way, it's not like you're alone. You also feel not only the influence of people that push you frontally, but also the influence of people that try to make your way like you, but uh, they are bothering you with their arms and so on, and this influences your motion. These Navier Stokes equations were a little bit of a revolution. They are nowadays used every day for weather prediction. And they allowed to solve the paradox, in particular, uh, with the equations of Navier and Stokes, you don't have this zero resistance phenomena observed by d'Alembert. And now the birds can fly. The other important ingredient before we can really use these equations of fluids were the computers. Computers are the totally great uh, invention of the 20th century. Since the middle of uh, 20th century, the, the inefficiency they have gained a factor like uh, 100 billion, some th 1,000 billion, something like this. And uh, in the past decades, we've been able to really solve these complicated equations of fluids with the help of computers. And describe this kind of uh, flight by bats by means of mathematical equations and computers. A general comment that should be made is that the flight of bats is very impressive. If you look, you see, we look at bats flying. They make sudden changes of direction. They are very mobile. Uh, people would love to make flying devices that would be as reactive as bats. And uh, this is, we are still far from it. Some people studying this, some teams studying this, and. Here, I can only show you this as example. It's a program that is being done at Brown University, Bat Flight Research Program. And it will reflect exactly the kind of projects in which mathematicians get involved nowadays. Our multidisciplinary research team consists primarily of researchers from biology and engineering and includes significant collaboration with researchers in computer science and applied mathematics, all working to characterize these unique flight capabilities to understand the role that the bat's bones, skin morphology, and wing motion all play in enabling this behavior to model this mechanism and ultimately to emulate them in engineered systems. And uh, you see the kind of things that they have to study for that. Understand what is the fluids, what is, what is the velocity of the fluid of the air near the wings of a bat. 
Look at this. Only with computers can you obtain such kind of computations at which uh, at each point you will see where the air will go. Look also at this. You see here near the tip of the wings the rotation. It is this generation of rotation which uh, allows to overcome the paradox of d'Alembert and make sure that there is really a resistance which is felt by the wings enabling the flight and so on. So that's one example of things that you encounter mathematics in that you would not necessarily think about, describing the flight of bats. And that's not all. When we think of bats, we think of flight, but we also think of what? It's the other, yes, this, the ears. Echolocation. Bats have the ability to find their way to recognize, to find their presence, so on, by using their ears. Sending signals and hearing about the reflection of the signal. Bats are in general not blind, contrary to uh, popular misbelief. But just they can do without watching for most of, their, most of their tasks. They are not the only animals to have developed this echolocation sense. Some dolphins do it too, some birds do it. People who like manga uh, certainly know about this uh, famous character, uh, the Toichi, the blind samurai, who is uh, very, very clever and has the ability to, ability to, to fight with sword just by listening to, to, to the sounds. Uh, of course, he is a legendary character, but there are some people, sometimes called human bats, who develop this kind of skills, they become blind very early and so on, they make sounds, for instance, with the tongue and listening at the reflection, they can know if there is an obstacle or not. This is a picture of one of these uh, examples. So echolocation is a feature, a property, uh, which has developed several times uh, in the story of uh, living beings. It is based of course, on equations, and in particular, on, the, on using wave equations and looking how they reflect. Wave equations can be, this can be waves, electromagnetic waves, like you would uh, do in some radar. Radar is also the same principle. You send a wave, you see what's reflected. Or this can be sound waves. Here are the equations of sound. We've been using it since the beginning of this talk. What is sound? Sound is small variations in the pressure. And uh, waves can propagate, that is, there can be a small variation that goes up and down and up and down in the pressure. And if it goes in a periodic way, we consider this as a pure sound. It will come with a certain frequency. It can be in music A, B, C, or whatever. And it will come with a certain strength. And this corresponds to the amplitude. You know, if the difference in pressure is big, we hear a loud sound. If it is small, we hear a faint sound. And if the frequency is high, we hear it high-pitched. If the frequency is low, we hear it low-pitched, etc. This is also mathematics dominated. This, uh, by the way, the scale A, B, C, etc. Uh, originally is called the Pythagorean scale. Uh, this was the first. Uh, uh, reasonably rigorous construction. And uh, you know the game. For instance, the standard, the basic A is uh, 440 beats per second, 440 hertz. If you multiply by two, you go to the next octave, so this will be the A uh, above. If you divide by two, it's the octave which is uh, below. If you multiply by uh, three halves, you go to the, from, uh, from uh, uh, a, you go to, okay, you go to the, to the Kent, I will not be able to, to say it in English, and so on, from, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, using this, uh, you will uh, be able to, re to reconstruct the complete scale. Now, the analysis of sound is also a mathematical story, and starts in particular with this guy, Joseph Fourier, and his work. Joseph Fourier was a remarkable man, at the same time successful as an administrator, as a politician under Napoleon, 
founder of harmonic analysis, pioneering of uh, mathematical physics and of Egyptology. And uh, in 1822, he published this book, one of the important treatises in 19th century, Analytic Theory of Heat. That was an advent another adventure. The idea that we are going to explain mathematically things such as uh, hot or cold. This was really daring. And one of his big ideas was that any periodic signal, that is a signal that repeats itself, should be decomposed, could be decomposed as a superposition of sines and cosines functions. Sines and cosines are the most simple periodic functions. This is just like looking at the projections of a regular circular motion. You see, if the angle is theta here, this is a sine, this is a cosine. This is the sine function, this is another one, this is another one. And it corresponds to pure sounds, as I just explained. Now, this Fourier idea looks weird if you never heard about it. How could it be that I can represent any signal with just this, this and that? This looks too simple. If I take a signal like this, it's clear that by adding functions like this, which are smooth and nice, I will never obtain such sharp edges. However, as we said, no problem. Just add an infinite number of them with various weights corresponding to the amplitude of the sound, various sounds, if you think of these as pure sounds, and various frequencies. And we can reproduce anything like this. This signal, for instance, looks pretty anything. In fact, I obtained it just for this lecture by putting together four sine functions. And you see on this example how with just four sine functions I can obtain something that looks very weird. That is Fourier analysis. Decompose any signal into sine functions. Decompose any complicated sound, if you want, into pure sounds. Fourier analysis has three fundamental principles. The first one is the one I described. The second one is that the more the signal is smooth and the least high frequencies matter. And the third one that will be important for, okay, yes, I will be very quick to complete this talk, and this one is the one that will be the last key idea. A signal cannot be well localized in time and frequency at the same time. If it has a given frequency, it cannot occur at a given time. This is the uncertainty principle. We used to think of uncertainty principle as something from the quantum mechanics world, Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we learned in high school and so on. But it's also a very classical phenomenon and in, uh, um, in sound, in music, if you want, we have it too. Uncertainty principle. A signal cannot be at the same time very brief, so localized in time, and very homogeneous in terms of sound, in terms of frequencies. Now, this is mathematics, but believe it or not, the bat has to fight against uncertainty principle every day to live. And uh, how is that? To explain this, uh, and I will illustrate this with sonograms. These are ways to represent sound by combinations of frequencies. In terms of time and the frequency, you look what there is. The bats, when they emit their sounds, they don't just say, or things like this. It's more complicated. Look at these pictures. Who's more high-pitched than constant, then, then diminishes. Like, Ooh, something like this. Or in this, it diminishes, starts very high pitched and then low pitched. Why do they do this? It's because of this uncertainty principle. Imagine you're a bat. Your problem is to find praise, to live, to eat. Bat is very efficient hunter. It can get an insect in a few seconds. Just using ears. For this, you have to measure the position of the prey, but also the velocity. If you know where the prey is, but the prey is escaping, you will not get it. How do you measure the position? That's easy. I just make a very brief sound, and I measure how much time it will take to come back. Here I am. This is the wall. I want to see how far away the wall is. I send the signal, and I know the speed of sound, so 
I measure uh, what is the amount of time between the emission and the reception, and this will tell me where the obstacle is. But nothing about the speed. How do I detect the velocity? If the wall is moving, for instance, how do I detect this? The answer is using the Doppler effect. Doppler effect is this effect according to which when you are uh, driving on the street and there is an ambulance coming, you hear that the sound of the ambulance is changing just as it passes by you. Maybe it is something like this. It's not because it changes pitch just for you. <laughs> no. Even if you're an important person and so on, it is because the relative motion has changed before it is approaching and after it is going away. When the wall is approaching, imagine I'm singing against this wall. If the wall is approaching and I sing at a certain frequency, since the wall is approaching me, it will come back to me with a slightly less amount of time between two peaks than should be. So the frequency that I receive will be higher. On the contrary, if the wall is going backwards, the frequency that will be back will be lower. So maybe I, uh, I don't know, I, I send, uh, let's say it is, a, 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 I'm not, not comfortable with the, with the English name. So I send A, okay? If what comes back is a, is a A sharp, it means that the wall is coming towards me. If what comes back is a, is a G sharp, so it means that the wall is going on the other direction. It's going backwards. It's uh, getting further and further from me. That's what the bat uses to determine the velocity in a nutshell. But then, if you want to measure at the same time the position and the velocity, you need to have a very brief signal to have a good measure of position. And you need to have a constant frequency sound to have a good measure of the velocity. It's impossible to have both. So you have to make a compromise. The compromise is what the bat does with this song, which is relatively brief, but several frequencies at the same time. Ew, something like this, will be a compromise. And the bat will adapt the song to the phase of hunt that it is doing. If it is uh, away from the prey or very close, it will be different. You can see it on this example of sonogram. This is the sound emitted by the bat, and this is the reflection that it analyzes. And the bat does it all at the same time, looking at the prey, looking at the obstacles, everything. It's remarkable. This is an example of the song that they will be doing. Ew, something like this, etc. And uh, this is an example of the trajectory that it will do. With the, uh, these are the locations where it emits the sounds. You see many, many emissions when it becomes very near the prey and when it becomes very important to have the exact position, where before position and velocity were maybe equally important. You can analyze this. There are formulas that you find from information theory, from an uh, engineer's book, to analyze how good the bat is at exploiting the signal that it is emitting in uh, the sense of extracting information about the position. And bats uh, remarkably nearly achieve the theoretical efficiency limit. If you were to devise, uh, try to, if you try to devise a system that analyzes the sound coming from the reflection, we'll never do much better than the bats. They are near the optimal that can be done. All through nature, remarkable. Simulate a bat. This is some uh, picture extracted from a book of bats. We are still far from it. That's all this, in amazing, in integrated, in a head that is that, uh, that big. It uh, makes all this, analyzes the signal, takes the decision, captures thousands of uh, insects per night, amazing. We can, in fact, in a way, it is extremely inspiring. And this is the end, I will end with this, that in a way, uh, bats have inspired some development of mathematics, or we can see it in this way. This is one of the most interesting stories of the past uh, decades about signal analysis, the birth of wavelets, which is the sequel of Fourier analysis. And uh, it came through industry and the will to detect, like, you know, um, petrol under, underlying uh, in some uh, ground or whatever. 
rather than using, uh, making big explosion and seeing what is the reflection, one of the engineers had the idea to do it by sending small signals which are modulated in frequency and look at the reflection. This is how Yves Meyer, who is uh, one of the world experts in uh, wavelets, uh, put, it, put the story. Goupillot, so that's the name of this engineer, suggested to send underground a vibration, short and modulated in frequency instead of having explosions. And the energy which is spent and the damage is much reduced. The same principle is used by the sonar of the, the radar of the bat. Vibrosismic was born. Physicists had to give way to specialists of signal processing. They made up computer softwares which, in a sense, imitate the behavior of the brain of the bat. So see this in some kind of amazing twist. We were thinking of mathematics as a way to study bats. And now, in a way, bats, we think of them as a way to do new mathematics. So that was it. That's the uh, uh, end of this talk. Here I put some thanks to people who uh, helped me prepare it uh, through discussions some of my colleagues in uh, Paris 6 or in Ecole Normale Supérieure of Lyon, some people from industry, particularly from radar industry. And uh, because you've all been very nice boys and girls, here are a few short movies about the bat. How does the bat work? Okay, this is the bat in blue, this is the prey. This here, every time it does this, it's that it emits one sound and then uh, analyzes and, and then uh, gets near, uh, near the prey. Uh, this is when it's a very simple situation, but it can also do much more complicated situation. Let's look at this one. Ah, you think it missed it. One, and then the second one will follow. Sorry, yes, yeah, these were two preys, and the, the bat caught the, 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 caught the two preys in the end. In this example, there is a moving prey and there is some other things which are not prey. And the bat will detect it. Detect the prey. It's always, you see, the bat does always this kind of circling thing and exploring. It has at the same time to see where all the, what all the environment is doing, varying the uh, direction of emission. And did I shoot them all? Yes. In this last example, bat is able to recognize the prey even if it is not moving. Very sensitive, so in a way it can detect some texture and so on. This is crazy difficult to reproduce. Yeah, here it is. Okay, thank you. Oh, because if the prey is non-stationary, you detect that it's moving. If, if, the prey, if the prey is stationary, remember, it doesn't use this, this is, this is at night, it doesn't use this the sight. So it has only to uh, use the reflection. Uh, so you have to distinguish a stationary prey from stationary non-prey. This is not easy. And you see it first approached very closely 
maybe some suspicion and then get it. All this is done in just a few seconds. Uh, a bat catches uh, 10 prays per minute, something like this. This is much slowed down, yes. This is much slowed down. 10 prays per minute. This is a figure you can re retain. How does it compare to a whole bunch of This is the, the wonder, frankly. I, uh, uh, um, but uh, there are all the other bats to deal with, but if you think about it, they have to deal with all the trees and all the... Uh, everything. It is... Uh, I uh, think, if you, look, if you look at the, at the bat uh, circling and so on, it avoids the trees, it avoids the world, it avoids you, everything. It has to think of everything at the same time. This is magic of the, of the brain. It's fascinating what they, what they can do just by learning. They have, uh, people have made tests also about um, how well they appreciate, uh, I mean, uh, in an environment, how much they get close to the, to the walls, they have quantified this kind of thing and so on. They have also sometimes made experiments cheating them uh, in various ways. And um, uh, they perform extremely well with all the, all the tasks you try. You have books written in the, 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 the author I gave uh, here in particular, has, there, is a, there, is a, there is a book by this guy in which all this is described. Speaker's corner. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so I had a question. You mentioned how uh, you thought imagination was uh, very important in math using uh, and creativity using uh, Perelman's example. And so I was wondering if you had any way, um, as a mathematician, to stimulate this simulation, uh, this uh, sorry, this imag ima uh, imagination and creativity yourself. Or I don't know if maybe art has like a big place in your life in addition to math and like ah. if you have any way of stimulating this imagination and creativity in your work? Um, there are uh, for sure but everybody has, a, everybody has a recipe of his or her own. I mean uh, some mathematicians need to work uh, listening to music, others need complete silence, some are fond of uh, theater or, or museums or whatever. It uh, depends a lot on the, on the people. I don't think there are universal recipes that work for everybody, or maybe they would be taught in math courses. Uh, the fact that such uh, complex uh, uh, algorithms are produced in nature is, of course, uh, very uh, striking. Let me uh, mention without ambiguity that I, am, I completely believe in the, the theory of evolution of uh, Darwin. Uh, still, it is true that when you see this, it is absolutely uh, extraordinary. First thing, the most important first thing we have to recall about theory of evolution is that the time scales are so long that there is no way we can use our intuition to understand this. When you try to think about changes occurring on hundreds of millions of years, there's no, there's no way. And second thing, um, here this is all about, this is uh, all about the fact that the brain has this extraordinary ability in, uh, in living beings for developing complex organizations and uh, amazing patterns. And uh, the amazing ability that it is able to reassign, transform its uh, functions from, from one goal to another. Uh, one, of the, one of the other fascinating uh, examples that we all know is reading ability. Um, if we are in Darwinian perspective, it is clear that we were never selected on reading ability. Uh, reading came much too late for, for that. 
and for a long time was just for a few people. So it, there was no selective pressure on reading. The same for doing mathematics. We were never selected to do mathematics. <laughs> this is very clear. <laughs> however, however, it works. And our brain is able to do mathematics and is able to do reading by reaffecting some areas that had uh, other purposes or other functions about this. And it's fascinating that it uh, manages to work. Um, recently, I read this uh, beautiful book on reading that maybe some of you know. It's called Proust and the Squid. Uh, and uh, analyzes a lot all the complex, um, the complex mechanisms which operate while we are reading. We think it's so simple, but it's so tricky, so difficult. So delicate, the reading. Many areas of the, of the brain are, are put together. It's a very complex algorithm, too. And not only did it uh, evolve, so we believe, naturally, but it was not selected. It is the important thing about brain. It's, it's something that has been selected for being very plastic and uh, very able to reconstruct things and reorganize and so on. And we know it also. Examples of brain plasticity was in this talk, like these people who learn to analyze reflections of sounds to compensate for some disability and so on. This is also plastic uh, of the brain. It's uh, amazing. Just, just pick up. It will be okay. This is fascinating. I didn't know that. Uh, this is another example of something that is, that is fascinating. Um, I have no, no clue on this. <laughs> you know, the brain, uh, even the most simple things in the brain. One day, some guy came to me to, uh, with the hope that I could help him in some mathematical problem relating to just synapse formation. It was not even not even brain organization, just the process of one synapse. And it was crazily complicated. Uh, everything, everything related to brain is, is, uh, is fascinating. Yes, problems for the next millennium. Uh, it's a mixture of both, uh, in the sense they, they, they are born with the ability to learn this. But the, burn, the, the, the bat has to, has to learn it and to, well, to know where, uh, how, how, how this is exactly to calibrate. Um, by the way, the, it may depend uh, on things such, are, such as altitude, etc., differences in uh, pressure, the way you analyze the reflection. The speed of sound may not be exactly the same depending on this or that condition. So all these things are, are things the bat, has to, the bat has to learn. And um, by the way, um, also regarding, you know, there was, or, there was kind of revolution in artificial intelligence in the past uh, decades or so, and now it's started to do really well in, in the sense that people have learned not to, we have not made so, ma so much progress in um, semantics and analysis of uh, science and logical thinking and so on, but we have made much progress in making the machines learn statistical recipes so that we give a lot of information to the machine and it learns from the information what, uh, what is good, what is bad, a little bit as the bat which learns by trial and error. Uh, what are the good characteristics of the sound to think about and what is important in the sound that we receive. So now we are very good at making machines that learn, for instance, to do translation and things like this, and uh, in a way, but in a way not knowing what we are doing. And the bat is the same kind of. It doesn't know what it's doing, but learns and is excellent, is very excellent at uh, learning.
Yes, and uh, for if we want to make, to simulate a bat, a device that would like, like a bat or whatever, uh, certainly it will have to learn at, by trial and error, right? All the characteristics to integrate, to integrate all the information about the obstacles, the goal, etc. 